This small child, this tiny, fragile life, carries with it the hope of all humanity. This small voice, now crying out in dark chambers, will one day still the raging sea, will call forth the dead to rise and live. This voice will declare it is finished and shatter the grip of sin. These small hands, now grasping for comfort, will one day restore sight to the blind, will break bread and feed the multitudes. These hands will feel the piercing cold of an iron spike and bring salvation through surrender. These small feet, now wrapped in cloth, will one day travel countless miles upon dusty roads, will stand firm upon rushing water. These feet will crush the snake's head and step forth from an empty tomb, victorious. This small child, this wondrous, perfect gift, is Jesus, our Savior, the promise of eternity. Oh, 
Why? Why? Why did Jesus come to earth? Why forsake the majesty and fellowship of heaven? Exchanging a palace for a stable. Immortal comforts for a feeding trough. And robes of glory for the feeble body of an infant. An unparalleled irony, this supreme, unrivaled nobility experiencing absolute and total humility. Our sovereign God, Emmanuel, as a baby. He didn't come to heap shame upon sinners or to judge and cast out the impious, but to break bread with those called unrighteous. He didn't come to illuminate every mystery of the cosmos or to enlighten the intellectual, but to fulfill the testimony of prophets clothed in rags. He didn't come to elevate a single nation or to advocate a particular political affiliation. He came because he saw you broken in need of salvation. He saw you lost and abandoned crying out, surrounded by deaf ears, fighting through the tears, but beaten down by the torments of this world. And unable to bear your distress, he renounced his eternal throne, walked the earth, bore the stripes, accepted the nails, and gave up his last breath, so that you could receive the breath of life. Our holy, infinite God beheld your pain, perceived your heart, and determined that your soul was worth dying for. From the manger, to the cross, to the empty tomb, it is all a story of profound love, of a Savior who rescued his children from darkness, of a blameless king who declared that no sacrifice was too great for the sake of his beloved creation. Why did Jesus come to earth? He came for you.
Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen which were just as they had been told. We've come now for a time of having communion. If you have some bread and juice at home, I encourage you to pull that out right now and uh, prepare your hearts to receive the bread and juice symbolizing the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. 
uh, shed for us. So at this point, if you would uh, take those things out, and let's pray. Heavenly Father, I ask that you take these ordinary elements of bread and juice and set them aside for your sacred and holy purpose, representing the body of Christ and his blood. Touch us during this time, Lord. Make this Christmas communion a very special moment. The Apostle Paul writes this, For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread, and when he'd given thanks he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. If you would take the bread at this time and partake. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now partake of the juice. Oh, Lord God, thank you so much for sending Jesus who died for us that our sins could be forgiven. Thank you that his body, he gave it up willingly, was broken so that we could be set free. That his blood was poured out for the forgiveness of sins. We accept that. We thank you for your gift. In Jesus' name, amen. Merry Christmas. You know, I really wanted to have an in-person Christmas Eve service at the church and, and make it really beautiful and special for a pastor. That's always one of the biggest 
nights of the year. And it's, uh, for, for many years now, it's been a, a real highlight of my ministry. But with the COVID virus hitting the way it is, uh, we have to be open to change and be flexible. And so we're doing the best we can. Uh, we didn't have an in-person service this year, but we're online. And I just want to thank you for joining us tonight for this uh, Christmas Eve service online. It's, uh, it's not the same, but I want you to understand that even though we're separated, that we're apart in our different homes, that through Christ there is a unity. Through Christ we are joined together in spirit. And so I, I hope you've enjoyed the service so far and that this, this message will really impact you in, in a special way. Uh, I've preached many, many sermons on the theme of Christmas and the story of Mary and Joseph. And I really felt like the, the message that the Lord laid on my heart to give to you tonight is not based on one of the common stories of Christmas, of Mary and Joseph, but I really wanted to talk about a bigger picture taken from Philippians chapter 2. So, so we're going to look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 through 11. And this is the Christmas story, but it's taken from a, a different perspective, understanding that Jesus pre-existed, that Jesus was God and then took on human flesh. He was deity and then took on humanity. And Paul makes this very clear. This is one of the best passages to really explain what's going on at the birth of Jesus. And so let's look at that. I'm going to read it to you here, and you can follow along on the screen. A letter from the Apostle Paul to the Christians at Philippi, and this is what it says. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit in, of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. And your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. All right, I want to go back and really look at this passage. And there's really two main parts of it that I'm going to talk about. First of all, verse 1 through 4, we're going to take a look at that. And then secondly, we'll look at verse 5 through 11 that really gets more into what the Christmas story is all about. But let's start with what Paul is saying, and he's writing to the, the Christians in Philippi. But I like to personalize things. I think we should apply scripture to ourselves. And so I want you to apply this to our church and to your life. So what Paul is saying here is he says, if you are united with Christ, you see that? If, if there's any, if you're united with Christ, if you're experiencing the Holy Spirit, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, then what's he say? He says, we should have a unity, that we should be of one mind, that we should be working together and have a unity in Christ and through Christ. And part of that is not being selfish. It's having this love. He, he says, make my joy complete. You'll really make me happy, church, if you guys really love each other, get along, and, and help each other out, and, and do these kind of things, having the same love, and be united in spirit, have one mind. You know, that's what he's talking about, have one mind. And then there's this part here, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. That is the opposite. 
Don't be selfish. Don't do anything out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Now, I like to illustrate uh, things, and so I'm going to tell you a, a story here that uh, comes from Alice. She's now a grown woman, but when she was in first grade, she wrote this in an article that I read. Uh, she talks about when she was in uh, uh, first grade, uh, she uh, sat in the class and was really enjoying the class, but the girl behind her brought in a present, a little tiny Christmas gift. It was only one inch by one inch, but it had this uh, a beautiful wrapping around it. It was white with, uh, with red wrapping around it, and it was just exquisite. And her little first grade mind, her five, five six-year-old mind, just couldn't get, get away from that. And she kept focusing on that little gift that sat on the desk of the girl in back of her. And so she just kept thinking about it. What must be inside that little box? Something beyond imagination. Something that's incredible is in that little box. And the more she thought about it, and this happens to all of us, comes that point when she thought, because I desire it, I deserve it. I should have that gift. And so she made a plan and she took the early bus and she got to school uh, before anyone else usually. And so it wasn't hard for her to go into the classroom early without anyone else there. And she went over to that little tiny uh, exquisite Christmas gift on, on the girl's desk. And, and she, 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 no one was around. She grabbed it and then her fingers ripped it apart looking for what's inside the box. It was going to be hers. And when she finally opened it up, there was nothing. There was nothing. And then came this shock of, it was just a decoration. It's an empty box that was just on her desk as a little decoration for Christmas. And here she destroyed it. She to totally ripped it apart. And there was no way to put it back. And now she had to live with that guilt of what she'd done. And she writes about that years later, still feeling somewhat guilty of that action as a little girl in first grade. And that's what Paul is talking about. He's talking about how, how we do those kind of things. That selfish ambition, that vain conceit. It's natural and it's a part of our old nature and it takes over and, and we do these things that hurt other people. And what the passage is saying, and especially at this Christmas time, and knowing what's going on around us with the, with the virus and all of its effects, I see people getting impatient. And I, I see people getting frustrated and they're lashing out and they're reacting. Uh, and, and that's understandable. That, that self-centeredness just comes uh, along because we're tired of this virus. We're tired of, of all these restrictions. But the Apostle Paul and the Lord Jesus is telling us to, to get beyond that, to do nothing out of vain conceit, but count others as better than yourselves. I love this. It says, not looking to your own interests, or another version would say, don't look only to your own interests. Yeah, we, we have to care about ourselves and take care of our own uh, bodies and, and, and all, but also look after the interests of others. Be interested in others and what they're doing and their concerns. And so uh, that, these are all things that are, are pointing us to uh, relationships with other people. Have this attitude that Christ had. Now, I want to uh, go on here to illustrate this with an acrostic. Now, this is just the same principle that Paul's talking about. I just took some of those words and the principles of loving others and wanted to explain it in a Christmas way. What does this mean? What does it mean to, to really have Christmas love? And these are all part of that love, love others that come with it. The, the caring. So this is spelling out Christmas love. And if you want to write down something for this sermon, this is what you write down. This is the kind of the, the key thing to remember about what are we to do? Well, we're to give Jesus a Christmas gift. What is the Christmas gift you can give Jesus? Well, Treat others really nice. Be really, really kind to them. And this is some of the words that go along with that. This is how we give a Christmas gift to Jesus, is that we're caring. We're helping. We're reaching out. 
We're including others. We're serving. Instead of the attitude of serve us, it's service. Uh, we're, we're thankful, that attitude of gra gratitude, that thankfulness to God. Being merciful, giving people a break, forgiving them, let, letting it go. Don't let it bother you, you know. Uh, acts of kindness and sharing. We, we share our, our, our money to help other people out. We share our lives with people. We spend time with people. And then there's more. Uh, love, listening, obeying God, valuing people, enjoying life. And I wanted to end with that, enjoying life, because God does want us to enjoy this beautiful gift of life that he's given us. And so let's see if you can memorize these. No, no how about just the last four? That's a lot to memorize. But can you, can you remember the last four? Listening, you know, love, L-O-V-E, listening, obeying God, valuing people, enjoying life. Okay, I'm going to stand in front of this and see if you can remember those. All right? So the first one is L. What does that stand for? Listening. Listen to other people. That's a way to love them. Be interested in what they're saying. So listen to other people. Listen to God. So L-O-V-E. L is listening. O is what? O, just like Joseph, he obeyed God. And when we hear from God, we need to obey first time right away. So listening, obeying God, and then V. What did I put for V? You remember? V is valuing people. Valuing people. And that is just, some people think possessions are, are, are what we're supposed to focus on. People are more important than things. So we need to value people. All right, and then the, the E stands for what? Enjoying life. Enjoying life. So I just want you to, to think of that, uh, of those things, and how um, important it is to really give Jesus a gift and love people in all these different ways. Now, I want to read something to you that I came across some years ago. This is talking about Christmas love. It's actually just talking about love. But an author, and I don't know who the author was. I, I got this and didn't have an author. This is so well written. And those of you who are familiar with 1 Corinthians 13 are going to hear the phrases are very similar. He based it off of 1 Corinthians 13. It's a love chapter. And so he put it in a context of Christmas. So listen as I read this, talking about love. If I decorate my house perfectly with plaid bows, strands of twinkling lights, and shining balls, but do not show love to my family, I'm just another decorator. If I slave away in the kitchen, baking dozens of Christmas cookies, preparing gourmet meals, and arranging a beautifully adorned table at mealtime, but do not show love to my family, I'm just another cook. If I work at the soup kitchen, carol in the nursing home, and give all I have to charity, but do not show love to my family, it profits me nothing. If I trim the spruce with shimmering angels and crystal snowflakes, attend a myriad of holiday parties, and sing in the choir's cantata, but do not focus on Christ, I have missed the point. Love stops the working to hug the child. Love sets aside the decorating to kiss the husband or wife. Love is kind, though harried and tired. Love doesn't envy another's home that has coordinated Christmas china and table linen or a new snowblower. Love doesn't yell at the kids to get out of the way, but is thankful they are there to be in the way. Love doesn't give only to those who are able to give in return, but rejoices in giving to those who can't. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Video games will break. Pearl necklaces will be lost. Golf clubs will rust. But giving the gift of love will endure. Isn't that well said? Oh, I just really lo love reading that, especially around Christmas time, to remind us of Christmas love. And that that is what we're supposed to be expressing, Christmas love. 
Well, I've only covered the first four verses, so let me move on to what really relates to the theme of Christmas, Jesus coming. So I'm going to go back here to these verses. It's talking about have this attitude in Christ. And then Paul goes on and talks about Jesus. Now this is the explanation, the purpose of Jesus being born to Mary and Joseph. This is the overall purpose of why we celebrate Christmas. This is Jesus who, being in very nature God. I want to explain that. That Jesus existed before he was born. Jesus was in the beginning when there was the creation. It says in John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John is using that, that uh, word to represent Jesus. That means Jesus. In the beginning was Jesus. Jesus was with God, and he was God. He was with God in the very beginning. And so we believe in the Trinity. I had a couple at my uh, church in Nevada, I remember, that came up to me after a service, and they said, Brent, you didn't, you didn't preach right today. Jesus is not God. Jesus is the Son of God. He's not equal with God. I was like stunned. I was like, who's been teaching you? I mean, that's not from the Bible. It's very clear that Jesus is completely equal with the Holy Spirit and with God the Father. It's the Trinity. There's an equality there. They're all God. Here's the difference. Jesus, although he was in very nature, he's very nature God. That's who he is, 100% God. He didn't want to, uh, it says in another translation, he didn't want to grasp. He didn't want to hold on to that position as God. He just didn't want to remain up in heaven. No, he was willing to give all that power and glory up for a short time, 33 years. And so he didn't use it to his own advantage. He didn't grasp hold of it. He didn't hang on to it. But rather, he made himself nothing. And the word there, nothing, really means going from God to human beings is like going from a human to an ant, but a thousand times greater. He went from being God with all that glory and power to taking on human nature, to becoming a human being with all of its frailties, with all of its weaknesses, its vulnerabilities. That's what Jesus did. That was God's plan as, as his role. So he took on the very nature of a servant. He took on human nature. And he came to earth not to be served, but to serve. And he, he lived a life. You know, for the first 30 years of his life, he was just an average, ordinary person living an ordinary life. He probably helped raise the family, being the oldest child. He, he had brothers and sisters. And he, and he probably had responsibilities. And he just lived among us. He just became a human being and lived. And then at age 30, for three and a half years, he had a ministry where he taught and he had his disciples and he trained people and he started his church. And so uh, for, for 33 years, he was in human likeness, being found in appearance as a man. He got hungry. He got thirsty. He got tired. All the same things that we go through, he experienced. That's what this passage is saying. That's what Christmas is really celebrating. That God became a human being. That God came as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to God. Now, you've heard before that God's plan was for Jesus to take away the sins of the world through dying on a cross. And that was an agonizing, torturous death. And it says here, he became obedient to death. Not just any death, but a death of torture. Jesus uh, died on the cross in obedience to God the Father and in order to free us from our sins. And so that is the Christmas story. Jesus became a human being and he did it to save us from our sins and he showed us the way and he humbled himself and he calls us to do the same. And because of that, God, he's highly exalted. Then it goes on. You know, therefore, God exalted him to the highest place. And now he's rewarded. He's at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And it says every knee is going to bow in heaven and earth. He's exalted. He's glorified. He's the Lord of Lords. He's the King of Kings. Uh, he's, he's God. He's God who became a human being. But if we go back to that verse 5, it says, have the same attitude. Have the same attitude. And so I just want you to understand and, and, and to focus on not just Jesus 
and why he came. He was God, became a human being, died for our sins. But verse 5, have the same attitude, that attitude of being a servant. And like I said before, this whole message tonight that I really felt the Lord want me to give you is Christmas love. It's love other people. That's a gift you give to Jesus. And that's what Jesus did. God didn't just stay up in heaven and, and, and keep distant from humanity. Jesus became human. That's called the incarnation. He entered into our world with all of our problems and sicknesses and, and all of our issues. He came and helped us. And that's the point I want to make to you right now. That we are called to get involved in people's lives. We are to be actively involved, engaged in loving our families and loving those around us and even loving the strangers that God brings into our lives. People are there and they're hurting and we need to be involved in their lives. Just like Jesus got involved in humanity and the, in the crisis and the problems uh, of the people, we are also called to have that same attitude, that servant attitude of getting involved in people's lives. And I want to end with a story, a true story, of Teddy Stollard. Teddy Stollard, uh, this is uh, in a book I read. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a touching story. Uh, when he was a, a boy, he didn't come from a very good home. In the fifth grade, he had a teacher named Mrs. Thompson. And Mrs. Thompson had read his files. And in his files, it talked about in first grade how he wasn't a very good student. And she could see that the way he came to school, his hair was never combed. His uh, clothes were pretty shabby. Um, his his um, appearance was, was pretty bad. And he didn't socialize very well with the other kids. He was a terrible student. And so she saw that right off. And she read his record that in the second grade, uh, his mother was very sick, very ill. And the third grade teacher had reported that year his mother had died. And his dad really didn't care about him. And he struggled in school every year. In the fourth grade, he was getting worse and more and more moody and wouldn't respond to anything. And now it was the fifth grade. And she was his teacher, Mrs. Thompson. And, and Teddy was, uh, didn't have hardly any friends. And uh, it came uh, close to Christmas time. And the children uh, brought their teacher a Christmas, Christmas gifts on a certain day. And she opened these gifts, and it was a great time. The kids of the class were all gathered around, and she opened them and thanked each kid. And she was pretty surprised when she saw a gift from Teddy, because he was a poor kid, wasn't, didn't have very much. And so she opened the package, and there, as, as Teddy's gift to her, was a rhinestone bracelet missing half the rhinestones and a bottle of cheap perfume. And the kids were kind of snickering at this gift. They could tell it wasn't, it wasn't new. It was used gift. And, and, but she, she didn't want any laughter at him. So she put the bracelet on and she put on the, the perfume. And, and she said, thank you, Teddy. Oh, this smells so good. Class, let's smell this. Smell this. And all the kids then go, oh, yeah, that is really pretty. That's, that's great perfume. And so it was, it was a very nice thing that he'd done. And so after the class was dismissed for the day and they'd gone home, Teddy lingered at the end and he came up to his teacher and he said, Mrs. Thompson, you smell just like my mom. And that was her bracelet. And she thanked him again and then he walked out. And it was at that moment that God in that still small voice spoke to Miss Thompson and said, you are to be Jesus to Teddy. Be Jesus to Teddy. And her whole demeanor and her attitude changed. And the next day when Teddy came in, she said, you need to stay after school. I'm going to spend time with you. And so she uh, started tutoring him after school and, and working with him. And not only that, she taught him other things besides schoolwork. She introduced him to other hobbies and interests and games and got him excited about uh, uh, other things and got him involved in after-school activities. 
And his whole demeanor started to change and he started to feel better about himself and he even started to make friends. And she tried to, you know, coach him and explain to him how to dress and how to comb his hair and how to brush his teeth and all these things that a mother would normally do. She took on that role and she totally transformed him. By the end of that school year, he would caught up to the other students. He was, he was happy and he was uh, uh, dressing much better and looking much better. And she not only kept in touch with him that year, but from then on, she would uh, call him and, and go to his uh, activities and constantly encourage him on and on and on. And so the years went by and, uh, and, and he graduated from high school and he wrote her a note. He said, Miss Thompson, I want you to be the first to know. I graduated from high school second in my class. She was so proud of him. She went to his graduation, was very proud of him. He went off to university. And after four years, he wrote her another note saying, Mrs. Thompson, I want you to be the first to know I graduated first in my class. And he went on to medical school. And after a few years, he wrote her another note saying, Mrs. Thompson, I just finished medical school. You can now call me doctor. Doctor. And he said, in one month, on the 27th, I'm getting married. My father's died. I have no family. You're the closest family I have. Would you come to my wedding? Would you sit at the seat where my mother would have sat? She agreed to do that, absolutely. And she came to his wedding, and she was there for him. Because she had given him what he really needed. That love, that care, that that Christmas love that we're called. We're called to get out and intervene in people's lives. And because of her actions of reaching out, it changed his life. And he became a very successful doctor and happily married. That's Mrs. Thompson hearing from God and being obedient to him. And God will speak to you too and tell you how to share love to other people. That's what we're called to do. That's the incarnation. That's what Jesus did. And that's what we as his followers are called to do. All right, I just want to end with a prayer and ask that God will just speak to you and speak to your heart uh, at this Christmas time. Uh, Heavenly Father, I just thank you for your word that, that, that calls us to be greater than the selfish ambition we often have than the self-centeredness that's so natural. I pray, Lord, that we overcome that and that you fill us with the Holy Spirit and with that spirit of love. Jesus has done so much for us. He's come and, 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 and died on the cross that we might have our sins forgiven. And Lord, in our hearts, we want to make him Lord. We don't have to wait Till the judgment, we're going to say it right now. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is Savior. He is God. And if there's anyone that doesn't know him as Savior, I pray right now that you'll give your life over to Jesus. That this Christmas will be a new birth spiritually for you. Just give him your heart. Ask him to forgive your sins and ask him to take over your life. And for each of us, Lord, I pray that you give us that insight into how to spread Christmas love. Help us, Lord, to spread Christmas love everywhere we go. For we want to be like Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us. And Merry Christmas.